Hi, I'm Nelson Burton, Jr., and this How to Bowl home video cassette is designed especially for those individuals who wish to improve their performance and understanding of the game. The tape is also great for beginners because it helps them learn the fundamentals and techniques. Use this tape for home study use as an individual or as a coaching aid for bowling league sessions. No sport would be complete without etiquette rules, and bowling is no exception. There's five basic rules you should follow when you're in league play or any other time. Number one, use your own bowling ball. Bowling rules say that you're not allowed to use anybody else's ball anyway, so don't violate the rules. Use your own ball. Number two, be ready when it's your turn to bowl. Nothing is more inconvenient to your fellow players than not being ready to bowl when it's your turn. Don't be in the bar or some other place when you're supposed to be up on the lane. Also, if you're late and not ready to bowl, it's an inconvenience to the league that follows you. They'll end up way too late, and it's just such a tremendous inconvenience, especially for the late bowlers. Number three, only one person on the approach at a time. Don't be filling around with two or three people on the approach. This is also illegal, and remember, that approach is yours for your complete frame until you've either made a strike or spare or the frame's been entered in the box score. Number four, and this is very, very right away to one lane on the right and one lane on the left. That means if I'm up on lane two, the individual on lane four, he's ready to go, he should be able to go. On lanes three and one should wait till you're finished your frame. And number five, and probably the most important, is confine your body English to your own approach area. Nothing is more dangerous in the sport of bowling than to move off your approach and run into somebody while they're making a shot. It can cause any kind of injury and damage, also interference, which makes a illegal shot. In the sport of bowling, other than your God-given ability, probably the most important thing is the bowling ball. Every individual should know that a proper bowling ball can make as much as 20 pins difference in their average during the whole year. Now, there's a, a couple of things you should consider when choosing a bowling ball. Number one, your style, and number two, your ability. Now, those go a long way in deciding the proper equipment for you. Three ingredients in a bowling ball. Number one, the weight. Number two, the type. That's very important. And number three, the grip. Now, let's deal with the weight first. Weights come from six to 16 pounds. The 16-pound ball is the most important and is the one used by all the pros for the very simple reason that 16 pounds is the best method to knock down the pins consistently. Remember, those 10 pins weigh as much as 35 pounds. The only way to consistently get strikes is use the maximum weight. But should everybody use the maximum weight? Not necessarily. Here's the reason why. In all sports where a ball is used, you can take basketball, football, golf, tennis, bowling is no exception, accuracy is the number one ingredient. And if you use too heavy a ball, you sacrifice accuracy for that little bit of extra power. So now we'll go through the weights for each individual, for the men, the women, and the children. For the men, almost all men can start with a 14-pound ball. They're strong enough, even as beginners, to use the 14-pound ball. And I feel that all men can move right up to the 16-pound ball after about two years of bowling. Now the women, most women start with around a 10-pound bowling ball. They're available in every bowling center for use in league, and after you get used to a ball, move up to a 12. Most women use a 12-pound ball. That's usually the weight that I suggest to go out and purchase a ball, right at the 12-pound weight. In fact, the 12-pound ball is the most sold ball in the country today. Women can still get accuracy with that 12-pound ball, not hurt their hands, and still get enough power to knock over the pins. And finally, for the children, the manufacturers are really conscious of the children. The many children at the beginning of the game today, they've made bowling balls down to just six pounds. And that's great. Now, I'll tell you what, as you go into a bowling center with a child and you want to find out the proper weight for a child so you don't injure his style, injure his muscles, and that he can handle it easily, have them pick up the ball off the rack. Hold it by their side for a count of, say, 10 seconds. If you don't see them being pulled off balance like that or having to grab the ball, you can rest assured that that ball weight is not too heavy for the child. Remember, start the child out with as light a weight as you can possibly find because they have young, tender muscles and they're developing their style. And if they're too heavy a ball, it pulls their body out of position, they end up with a bad arm swing. 
So for the youngsters, start them out with a light ball. If you can find it, go for the six pounder. Another important factor in choosing a bowling ball is the type. Before the 1900s, everybody used a wooden bowling ball. In fact, they varied in weight from 35 pounds down to five pounds. There are really no rules on what type of ball to use. Then, around 1901, the rubber bowling ball came into play for a couple reasons. Bowling lane surfaces had a coating called shellac over them. The rubber ball was very compatible with this shellac. This went on through World War II when the Japanese cut off the shellac to the United States here. Then the manufacturers, they invented something else, a lacquer surface. The rubber ball was compatible on the lacquer surfaces. But then around 1960, the lacquer surfaces began to go out and the surfaces we have today, the polyurethane surfaces, came in. Now the rubber ball didn't work good on the polyurethane surfaces, so the manufacturers came up with the plastic ball. Now the plastic ball was the ball of the 1960s and on into the 1970s. And then along came the bowling ball that you see most of the pros use today, and that is the polyurethane bowling ball. Now I'll go through the two balls that I believe are best for today's surfaces and tell you why, and you can make your choice. The polyester or plastic bowling ball that we saw come in the 1970s is an excellent bowling ball. It bowls well on almost all the polyurethane surfaces and the synthetic surfaces we see today. There's a number of good things about it. Number one, it's of medium price and it's available in all colors and all weights. The biggest drawback to the polyester bowling ball is that it is susceptible to cracking and sometimes chipping. Now remember, you can plug it up if that happens, but you hate to go through that time and time again. The ball that most of the pros use and most of the tournaments are one with today is the polyurethane bowling ball. This is also from the polymer family, like the plastic ball, but it is much harder and much more durable than the polyester bowling ball. The biggest assets to this bowling ball are three things. Number one, it hits almost all the lane surfaces we hit today. A little bit of the lacquer surfaces that are still left around the polyurethane surfaces, which most all of you bow on, and the new synthetic or artificial lanes that are coming in today. The second asset is its hooking power. It hooks a little more than almost any of the balls made before. And the third asset is that it is very, very durable. It's hard to chip or crack this ball. Now, the biggest drawback for all of us is naturally one thing that's anything that good in the United States is the price. It's a little more expensive than all the other bowling balls on the market today but I think it's well worth the price. You make your choice. If you bowl with a polyester ball and like the lighter weight and colors, by all means, use it. For the avid bowler, especially the guy who is there, or woman who is aspiring to get up to that 200 average, I recommend the urethane ball. The third element you need to decide on when buying a bowling ball is the grip. There are three basic grips in the sport of bowling. The conventional grip is indicated by the green tape that's where the fingers are inserted down to the second knuckle. Now the drawback to this grip is great for, for accuracy, but it really is very marginal on the power because your hand is too cramped. The second type of grip is a semi-fingertip grip, as indicated by the red tape. That's the grip where your fingers are inserted down between the first and second knuckle. And finally, the third type of grip is the full fingertip grip. That's the grip where the fingers are inserted to just the first knuckle, as indicated by the blue tape. Now you have three grips to choose from, but I'll give you my recommendation and what I've found that most of the great pros over the years have used. They've used the semi-fingertip grip because this is the best grip for easiness on your hand, for maximum control, and for maximum power. The semi-fingertip grip, remember, the fingers are inserted just between the first and second knuckle. And look at the power you have with this grip. Look at the 16-pound ball, roll it right on the tip of your fingers, right there between the first and second knuckle, but watch how easily my fingers come out of the ball. Tremendous control, yet easy on your hand. Now, the fingertip grip is fine for somebody who bowls all the time, but remember, most of the top pros have always used a semi-fingertip grip. Now you have the three elements for you to choose from, the weight, the type, and the grip. I recommend that you go to your pro shop, see your certified pro ball driller, let him work out what's just right for you. Remember, he can tell you the right weight, the type grip, and the type surface that you need in your bowling ball. Also, you do not have to purchase a new bowling ball. There are many used bowling balls that have been plugged up that can be redrilled just to your style. 
An often overlooked piece of equipment in the sport of bowling is the bowling shoes. They're probably one of the most important elements in the game. Now, when you go into a bowling center, you can rent shoes, rental shoes, and they're good quality. The biggest drawback is they're made for both left-handers and right-handers. They have leather both on the left sole and the right sole. I recommend that you invest, and I mean invest, in a good pair of custom shoes. All the manufacturers make them, and what they do for you over and above the rental shoes is very simple. Number one, if you'll notice the slide sole, it has a custom slide sole with these little bitty holes in it, which makes the sole accommodate all sorts of uh, approach conditions, whether it be in New York or Milwaukee or New Orleans, you'll be able to slide smoothly. Second, notice this corrugated heel. This heel allows the air pressure to flow out and under the heel so you don't stick at the foul line. And often overlooked is the right foot or the pivot foot. Notice how it has rubber in this area and that rubber or leather toe, which is important because as you push off at the final step, this touches the last the lane and gives you the power to push through the shot and make an excellent shot. Now, one other thing that I often see in bowling around the country is the use of powder. Sometimes people walk back on the carpet and build up static electricity on their shoes, or they have a soft heel on their shoe, and to the inconvenience of everyone else, they stick a little bit at the approach, they come out with a little talcum powder, and here they start throwing it down there on the floor, rubbing their foot in there. Now, this is not only dangerous to the other people bowling, but it's also illegal. You're not allowed to do that in the sport of bowling. If you see that happen in your league match, you call the proprietor and have that individual stopped immediately. Another important part of equipment in the sport of bowling is the gloves. Now, there's two basic types of gloves. One, the palm glove that has a device right there in the center of the palm that helps you fill out the center of the ball and keep a good feel all the way through the shot. When you put your hand in the ball, usually your hand will come off the ball and there's no feel between the ball and the hand. There's a little pad in here, you see it right there, that'll fill out that feel and keep that ball feeling nice and comfortable in the proper position on your hand. A device used by many of the top pros. The other device is the wrist device. This is designed for the women bowlers, basically, because they have the most trouble with their wrists flopping back or not staying in the proper position all the way through the shot. What you do is you put it on tight, it goes up all the way over the wrist, and what happens is many women, when they push the ball away, they have a tendency to flop back. This wrist device will hold that wrist in a nice, firm, strong position all the way through the shot so you get a good lift on the ball. Now, you've got your wrist device, you have your hands device, but you always have to keep a good feel on a bowling ball. If you watch the Pro Bowlers Tour on TV, you'll see something that the pros do all the time. You notice in my ball right here, I have some tape in the back and a little gripper in the front. I like to put the gripper in the front for feel, but your hand goes up and down. One week you may be a little heavier than the next, one week it may be hot in the bowling center, one week your hand may go up, one week down. What you have to do is be able to adjust the size of your thumb hole to keep that real good feel in the ball. So just take some electrical tape, buy some good electrical tape. I use number 33 here, and it's not a commercial, but it really is the best. It doesn't get too sticky, and you can take it in or out. I put it right there in the back of the ball to tighten that hole up and keep it nice and comfortable. You always see the pros do this. And the last piece of equipment that we use to, to keep a good feel is the rosin bag. Remember, don't get it on the approach. It's illegal to use it in the settee area, but pot a little bit on your hand just before you go up to make your shot, and you get that real good feel in the thumb hole. So remember, use whatever wrist device works good for you, but an absolute must is that tape and scissors. Here are the markings used in a typical scoring game in bowling. An X represents a strike. A diagonal slash represents a spare. F in the box represents a foul when somebody went over the foul line. A zero represents a split, and a slash straight across represents a miss. Now let's look at a typical score sheet. Remember, bowling is a cumulative score game. A strike is 10 plus the next two balls, and a spare is 10 plus the next shot. In this first frame, I knocked down seven pins in my first ball, but it was a split. Let's say the four, six, 10, as indicated by that zero up in that right-hand box. That indicates a split. Then I went for the split, missing all the pins, as indicated by that little slash across the zero, and my cumulative score for the first frame was seven. Now into the second frame, I threw the ball really well, 
and I got a strike, as indicated by that X up in the box. Now remember, a strike is 10 plus the next two balls rolled down the lane. I came up in the third frame, and lo and behold, another strike. Two in a row we call the sport of bowling a double. Now let's remember these two strikes. The one in the second frame is 10 plus the next two balls. The one in the third frame is 10 plus the next two balls. So as we come into the fourth frame, we'll have to trail back into the score sheet. I got eight on my first ball in the fourth frame as indicated by the eight up there on the score sheet. Now that reflects the score in the second frame. The second frame strike is 10 plus the next two balls. The third frame, the first ball I got a strike, that makes it 20. And in the fourth frame I got eight, that makes it 28, indicated by the 35 in the second frame. Remember, seven in the first, 28 more, makes 35 in the second frame. Now into the fourth frame again, we have a strike up in the third, we have eight on the first ball, and we missed all the pins. We left two remaining, as indicated by that slash up there in the box. Now that indicates 18 into the third frame. So 35 and 18 is 53. Remember that strike was 10 plus the next two balls, and that was eight and zero. Now the cumulative score carries on, so you have eight and zero, indicating 61 in the fourth. Now into the fifth frame. Once again, I made a good shot, a strike in the fifth. Remember, the strike is 10 plus the next two balls. Now into the sixth frame. I came up in the sixth frame, and lo and behold, disaster hit. The old G, gutter ball, zero on the first shot. So that doesn't have any effect on the fifth frame yet, that strike, because remember, that strike is 10 plus the next two balls. On my second shot in the sixth frame, I knocked down nine pins. And that gives me a cumulative score of nine for that frame, but it goes all the way back to the fifth. That strike is 10 plus the next two balls. The next two balls were zero and nine, and indicated by 19 being added to the 61 in the fourth. Now we have 80 in the fifth, and then we missed in the sixth frame, cumulative score, 89. As we go to the seventh frame, we knocked down eight pins on the first ball, as indicated by the eight in the corner. We converted the spare. Remember, a spare, as indicated up in that box, a diagonal line, is 10 plus the next ball roll down the lane. So let's see what I did in the eighth frame. Once again, disaster struck, an F. That's a foul. Now a foul is any time you cross the foul line with any part of your body, and regardless of how many pins you knock down, you still have to take zero for that particular shot. So that relates back to the seventh frame. My spare was 10 plus the next ball, and the foul is zero, so I only get a credit for 10 in the seventh frame. So now I have 99. Now when you have a foul, you must reset all the pins knocked down and shoot at a full rack again. That was done, and I knocked down nine of the pins, giving me 108, my cumulative score, through eight frames. In the ninth frame, once again, I knocked down nine pins on the first ball and converted the spare easily, as indicated by the diagonal line up in the box. As we go into the 10th frame, my first ball in the 10th frame was a strike. Now that allows me to have two more shots in the 10th frame. and also relates back to the 9th frame. You had a spare, which is 10 pins in the 9th frame, added to the next ball, which was a strike, that's 10 more, that's 20. As indicated by the cumulative score, 128 in the 9th frame. Now into the 10th, I throw my second shot in the 10th. Remember the first strike allows me to throw two more balls in the 10th frame. I got another strike. So I have one more shot coming up in the 10th frame. I'm entitled to a last shot. And on that last shot, I once again got a strike. Three strikes in a row. It's called a turkey in the game of bowling. And remember, the cumulative score carries forward. The first strike in the 10th frame was 10, plus the next two balls. The next two balls were both 10s. So I have a 30 for that 10th frame and end up with a final score of 158. The setup and the approach are the two most important elements in the game of bowling. You have to have a consistent and good approach to establish good timing and a good arm swing. In this segment of the instructions, we're going to show you the proper distance from the foul line, the proper distance right and left to set up for your strike shots, and the proper way to hold the ball and get up to that foul line consistently. First, as you step up on the approach, walk up to the foul line. As you reach the foul line, Turn your back to the pins with your heels right on the edge of the foul line 
and then take four and a half wrist steps forward to find your correct position. And the reason we're doing this is to find the correct distance for each individual away from the foul line for the starting position up here on the approach. Two, three, four. Now this half a step is to accommodate your slide. Turn around, see where you are. These markers are 12 feet from the foul line. These back markers are 15 feet from the foul line. Now every individual is going to be a little different. If you're six feet four, you have a longer stride than I do at five feet 11. Naturally, you're gonna be farther back. For the shorter person, they'll be maybe even in front of the dots. Notice the position and the distance. For me, it's about 12 to 13 feet, just slightly behind the first set of dots. Now when you get there, you found the correct distance from the foul line. Now the second and most important thing is to find the distance right or left. You don't want to stand way over here on the left side of the approach because you'd be coming in the left side. You don't want to stand way on the outside, you'd be lined up with the outside channel. I recommend to start for every starting shot on a strike ball until you find your correct position for your strikes on the lane is to put your left foot on the center dot. Now you're lined up with your right shoulder right over the second arrow. That's our recommended starting point for every strike ball. Okay, now you have your position laterally on the approach and the distance properly away from the foul line. Second, pick up your ball. Make sure that when you grab your ball, that you don't grab it like this. And I've seen it more often than not, even pros, they grab their ball, they're not looking, they're talking to a friend, up comes another ball and out goes a finger especially the little kids. If you have little kids you're teaching or watching the bull, watch it. When two 16-pound balls hit together, I've seen just broken fingers, literally broken fingers. So put your hands on the side of the ball, lifting it up in the rack. And here's a little trick that I've always found. Try to hold the ball for your right-handed bowlers. Try to hold the ball in the left hand as long as you can. Why tire out the muscles and tighten the muscles in the right hand before you want to make a shot? When you set up, get back on your center dot. You have your left foot on your center dot. Insert your fingers in the bowling ball first, all the way down to the natural position. I have a semi-fingertip grip, so they're halfway down between the first and second knuckle. Place the thumb in the ball. It should be snug, but not so tight that you feel like you're gonna hang up in the ball. Then, people wonder, well, what position should my fingers be in? A little trick that the pros always use to get a tighter grip is they sometimes tuck that little finger underneath the ball and then the index finger, you can use that to grip the ball too if you feel like you need a little more grip on the ball, but by all means, put those fingers where they're comfortable on the ball. Second, get back to your starting position. Put that elbow right on your hip, remembering to support the ball with your left hand, not your right. Remember, we want to keep as much pressure off your arm as possible. So let the left hand support the ball. Hold the ball in the palm of your hand with your right hand underneath it. The most important movement in the game of bowling is the push away, the first step in the push away in a four step delivery. The reason being is that it sets up your timing for your arm swing and your release so that if it's not in time, everything else is going to be out of kilter. Now remember your proper distance from the foul line. For me, it's just a little bit past the 12 foot mark here on the approach. I'm about nine inches back, but remember, my left foot is on the center dot so that my right shoulder is lined up with my second arrow strike target. Now, the mistake that many amateurs make, instead of pushing the ball away in the correct time, they get nervous and they just start walking like this and they'll push the ball away. You can't push it away, swing it, and get it all through unless you push the ball away at the correct time. The second mistake I see a lot of amateurs make, instead of getting the ball out, as I'll show you in one second, they just drop it down here like that. See how it pulls on your shoulder and pulls you out of, out of position. The proper way for the four-step delivery is to push the ball out and the leg extend out at the exact same time. Watch this. I push the ball out. As the, as the arm hits the apex of the swing, of the push away, the foot is extended all the way out. Let me go through that again. Push the ball out with the right foot, and they should extend out and meet at the exact same time, holding the left hand still underneath the ball until we go into the second part. Now, a lot of you will say to me, hey, Bo, I see all the pros using five-step delivery. Well, I'll show you why, and I'll show you how you can move into the five-step delivery after a few months and a few games of basic four-step delivery. To do the five-step delivery, just back up another 12 to 14 inches on the approach. In a five-step delivery, all it does is allow you to have a little more momentum to the foul line and a little more speed control on the bowling ball. And if you watch me, the five-step delivery is really not much different than the four-step delivery. You set up the same here, and you walk with your first step naturally being your left foot instead of your right foot. 
And all this does is give you a little momentum. Watch how the left foot goes out. And now right, I'm right back into my four-step delivery. Okay, I'll go through that one more time. For the five-step delivery, back up an extra foot or so on the approach. Left foot first, and that gets the body moving. Don't bend the shoulders. And push out and lock that arm out at the apex of the push away. When you take your second step, you also initiate your downswing. We'll go through it again. We've set up here on the approach with the left foot in the center dot. We've also made that first step, that push away with the ball extended. Now becomes a very, very important part of the game. Pushing that ball away is fine, but now you have to let it go. Release that left hand. Let that arm swing freely by your side, but we're not going to forget that left hand right away. Let that left hand come off the ball let that arm stay by your side as you're going into your second step. Now here's the position you should be in. You don't want your arm away from your body. You want it down there for leverage and control. That arm swing should be right next to your body on the downswing. Now your left hand comes back into play. If I let my left hand go way up in the air here or way forward like this, you can turn your shoulder or drop your shoulder. Let that left hand and arm work for you. If you'll hold that left hand and arm parallel with your shoulders, you'll pull your shoulder up. Look, if I have my shoulder dropped here, my arms away from my body, pull the left hand down, watch how it pulls that right shoulder up in the correct position and keeps that arm close to your body. Another thing, keep those fingers behind the ball and that wrist firm in this position. Here's a problem that most of you women have. As you initiate that downswing from the push away, you allow that wrist to flop like that. Keep that wrist firm and that ball centered in the palm of your hand all the way through the downswing. Here is the correct position for the downswing. Left arm parallel with the shoulders, right arm right next to your body, and hand underneath the ball. The third element of the approach is the backswing. We've been through the first element, the push away, the second element, the downswing, and here's the third element, and that's the backswing, your third step. Now, there's a lot of mistakes that are made in the third step and the backswing by pros and amateurs alike. Number one, they get their shoulders too far forward. They're down in here, because then they're going to release the ball into the floor on the next step. Number two, they let that left arm get forward. Hold that left arm back in the proper position. And here's a mistake that a lot of them make. They're coming into the back. Here we go. They're up here. Allow that arm to go at a natural height. I recommend somewhere around shoulder level. Let it come back in here, but don't let that hand move left or right. Keep that hand without movement at the top of the swing. Now, you notice this towel underneath my arm. Your arm should be close enough to your body at all times to support a towel or something on your arm and it doesn't fall out. Don't allow that arm to wander where the towel would fall out, out in here. Keep it underneath, keep it locked in. Now, another important element and a little trick that all the pros use is keep that index finger behind the ball. This is a reminder not to turn your hand on the backswing or flop that wrist down into a weak position. Remember this now. Keep the hand behind the ball and let the arm swing go to a natural height. And now we come to the critical point in any bowling shot, the explosion point, the point of no return, the point where you release the ball, the pivot step into the release and the follow through. Remember, we went out on one, down on two, back on three. Now let's stop it here before we go into the release. We're back here on three. We remember to keep that shoulders level, keep that left arm out, keep that chin up. Don't let your head get down here where you're throwing the ball down into the, the uh, approach. It kills the shot. Keep that hand behind the ball. Now watch the toe of my right foot. Notice how it's pointing right the direction I want it to go. As I come down and drive through into my last step and my hand's coming right by my side, I roll up onto the tip of this toe. That's one of the reasons we said in our shoe segment that you have to have a good pair of shoes. Point old leather tip, when you're up here, look it, I'm completely off the ground at one point as I'm driving through. Uh, if you slip at this point, you have a lot of problems. And also, this is the last chance to make what we call that foul line adjustment. When you're driving through here, a good player with a good feel, he can speed his arm swing up. He can speed the ball up. So remember, when you're back here, driving down, keep that right foot underneath you, keep that weight back. Now we're into the slide and the release. As we drive into the slide with a pivot step, remember, keep that arm right close to your body. Okay, now in the point of release, we want to keep that hand underneath the ball and keep the ball in the palm of the hand all the way. 
Now here's the action that the, you should have at the point of release. You're driving through, you should have, as you initiate your slide, your arm should be right next to your body. If you're too late, you'll drop the ball on the floor. If you're too early, you'll loft way out on the lane. So have that arm right next to your body as you initiate the slide. Now you don't want to just come to a dead halt with no slide at all. A ball should be released in the slide. All right, now the releases. We said keep that hand underneath the ball. That allows that wrist to do the action and give you the power. If you're over here, you have no power. You top the ball. If you're over here, the ball will spin and you'll go over the top of it again. Keep your hand underneath the ball all the way through the point of release. Now you have it close to your body. Now the thumb should come out around 12 o'clock. If you had a clock, this would be 12 o'clock. Let that thumb come out there. Now the natural rotation of the fingers will be around the ball. That's where you get the hook ball. You don't want the thumb to come out at 12 o'clock here and have the fingers come straight through the shot. You want them to rotate naturally around the ball. Watch my hand. I'm holding pressure on it. As soon as I relax it, it rotates around the ball. That's just the human nature. If you put your hand in that position at the point of release, you'll get the perfect release and the perfect roll. Thumb will come out at 12. The fingers will rotate from 6 around to 3 o'clock. That's the perfect release for the good semi-roller. And now we have our follow-through. Sure, you've come here to here. Now, here's a critical point. A lot of people try to steer the ball. All of a sudden, their elbow comes out like that. Invariably, you don't get the lift. The ball has not come off the hand before you start initiating, initiating that elbow bend, and the ball slides by. There's not enough power. A second mistake that pros and amateurs alike make is they come through here, they're lifting the ball off the hand, and all of a sudden, they fan the ball to the right. What this does is puts a spin on the ball to make it hook too quickly, and it goes left of their target. The key thing to a follow through is to allow your hand to rotate naturally around the ball, but you don't have to turn your elbow. Watch what happens to my elbow. As I come around the ball, the hand rotates, but watch the upper part of my arm. It doesn't rotate at all. I can completely turn that ball without moving my elbow. So remember this, as you come through, allow the hand to rotate, keep the elbow in line with the target, especially the inside of your elbow. Follow through to shoulder high. There are three basic releases that are effective in the game of bowling. The full roller, the semi-roller, and the reverse hook or backup ball. Now all three of these releases track or wear the ball in a different portion of the ball. First we'll deal with the full roller. That's the type of ball that tracks or wears when you roll it between the thumb and fingers as indicated by this white piece of tape. This type of roll is initiated with a release starting at 9 o'clock and the thumb rotating clockwise around the ball while the fingers rotate counterclockwise around the ball. This type of release is very effective on lacquer surfaces or surfaces that don't hook very much. The semi-roller is a type of roller that most all the pros today use. That's the roll outside the thumb and fingers. This is initiated by keeping your hand underneath the ball all the way. Thumb at 12 o'clock position on a clock, fingers at a 6 o'clock position on a clock. Allow that thumb to come out at the top and let those fingers rotate counterclockwise, 6 o'clock to 3 o'clock around the ball. This is the most effective all-around roll, and it works especially well on the polyurethane lane surfaces we have today. And finally, we have the reverse hook or backup ball, a shot that many women use. And that type of ball tracks on the opposite side of the ball. This type of roll is not very effective, but for the women that have used it for a long time, by all means, stick with it if you're averaging above 150. For you beginners, the roll is initiated by having your thumb way over here at the 3 o'clock position and having your fingers underneath the ball and then rotating clockwise around the ball. In order to break this habit, simply rotate your thumb up at 12 o'clock and try to make your fingers rotate counterclockwise around the ball. You'll have a good semi-roller and a very effective strike ball. This next segment of our videotape is probably the least understood by amateur bowlers and even some fairly good bowlers, and that's how to play the lanes and how to spot bowl. Number one, we're gonna deal with the strike ball. As I said before, we found our strike position on the approach, which I recommend to start from around the 20th board of the center board on the lane, and line that right shoulder up with the second arrow. Now, the reason we say the second arrow is for a couple of reasons, more than just one. Number one, most people play in that area. 
And as the lane gets older, it gets worn in that area and it becomes a higher surface friction area, causing the ball to hook a lot in that area. You can't start the ball way outside normally in a slick area, cross a low friction area, and end up in the pocket. Conversely, you can't play way down the center. You don't have enough angle of attack on the pins. But when I mean angle of attack in second arrow, is the second arrow is the 10th board from the right-hand channel, 10 boards in from the channel. Now, if you lay the ball down on that board and it works its way into the pocket, the 1, 3, that's the 17th and 18th boards. That's seven boards of hook to knock down those pins. Remember, those pins weigh as much as 35 pounds. This ball only weighs 16. You must have an angle of attack to knock them down. Now, let's take a shot down this second arrow, as I've indicated by the red tape, from our normal strike position on the approach and see what happens. If we get a strike, we're in the right place. If I don't, we have to make an adjustment. Here we go. Okay, that's pretty obvious that this lane is hooking more than a normal lane. So you have to make an adjustment. The golden rule of bowling, if you miss left, let the ball, let the body and ball move left. If you miss right, move right. Now, as you can see, I've missed left down and left the head pin standing. So I have to make an adjustment on the approach. I'm going to make at least a three board adjustment on the approach for every bo one board on the lane. Let's go back and try it and see what happens. I missed left. It's very obvious. The head pin's still standing. And here's how you have to adjust your strike ball on every bowling lane. Remember, they're never the same day in and day out, and even from morning to night. So I miss left. Here's the golden rule of bowling again. If you miss left, move left. If you miss right, move right. On this particular shot, I missed the head pin on the left. So I should move at least three boards on the approach for every board I move on the lane left. Example, three here would be one, two, three. From the second arrow where that red tape is, I should move one board to the left, which would be the 11th board on the lane. When you miss completely the head pin on the left, you have to make a bigger move, another three and one ratio to keep all the lines parallel going down the lane to accommodate your natural strike ball. So, one, two, three, that gives me six boards. I think I should move on this shot to just for that. So for six out there would be six up in the approach, would be two out on the lane. Conversely, if I had missed the head pin on the right, on a very slick lane. You can come in in the morning or sometimes they just freshly oil the lanes or go to a bowling center you've never bowled in, throw your normal strike spot and miss the head pin completely on the right. Move to the right. Don't move to the left and just try to point it down the middle. You won't have a right angle of attack on the pocket to get strikes. Move three boards, one, two, three, to the right. For every board, you move out on the lane to the right. And you keep moving until you get in the pocket. If you move three and one, you still don't come up, move another three and one. If you don't come up, move another three and one. Same way on this shot I'm going to adjust now. I'm going to move six and two. But if that's not enough, I would have moved nine boards here for three out there. Now let's see what happens with this shot. I'm going to make a six board move to the left on the approach, two board move to the left out there on the lane, and hopefully that'll bring the ball into the pocket. In this segment of our instructional tape, we're going to deal with the most important part of the game of bowling, regardless if you're a beginner, an intermediate player, or a superstar on the Pro Bowlers Tour, we all leave spares. And without converting spares, there's no way to be a consistent good bowler. Now there's two rules for the spare making. One when the head pin's down, and one when the head pin remains after the first shot. First we'll deal with the spares with the head pin down. For instance, if you leave a spare on the left-hand side of the lane, such as the seven pin, you move to the right-hand side of the approach to maximize your angle to convert spares on the left side of the lane. Well, I'll show you. I have the seven pin standing. I move to the right side of the approach because the seven pin is on the left side of the lane. And the important thing to remember, which makes spare making so simple, with the head pin down, all that you have to do is remember to use the third arrow from the right hand channel. Aim at the pin, draw an imaginary line with your eyes. Look at the pin, the seven pin. Look at the third arrow, and like a rifle, line it up. Look where your feet are standing. I'm indicated that by this red tape, lined up with the red tape going over the third arrow, and throw a nice, simple, straight ball 
over the, over the third arrow to the spare. There's no use throwing power or a lot of turn at a spare because all you have to do is touch it to knock it over. Watch this shot, straight over the third arrow and into the seven pin. We've already seen how to shoot spares on the left-hand side of the lane, such as the seven pin, by standing on the right-hand side of the approach. Now here's the spare that gives everybody the most trouble, and yet it's really the simplest. Ask any pro. It's the 10 pin, the spares in the right-hand corner of the lane. For the spare on the right-hand corner of the lane, remember we're going to play the third arrow again through a simple straight shot from the left-hand side of the approach, following through directly towards your target. I've seen many a women, as in men, a beginner, stand on the right-hand side of the lane to try to make the 10 pin. The ball either goes off in the channel or hooks by it. So we'll show you, using the exact same target we made the 7 pin with, we'll make the 10 pin by staying on the left-hand side of the approach. Watch this shot. Once again, 10 pins on the right-hand part of the lane, we move to the left-hand part of the approach to maximize our angle towards the target. Look right over the third arrow, look at that blue stripe going right over the red stripe, I'll go over the exact same target that I converted the 7 pin with, but just by increasing my angle and moving to the left side of the approach, I'll make it with that simple straight shot. Here we go. I've shown you how to make spares with the head pin down over the third arrow. And I've shown you how to make spares with the head pin still standing over the second arrow. But the most common spare leave where you have more than one pin up is the two, four, five combination. And this is the one exception to the spare rule. For, to make this and avoid the chop, what we call taking the 2-4 off and leaving the 5 with the ball breaking into it, we shoot the shot straight down the fifth arrow or the left-hand side of the lane. We move to the extreme left, just like we were going to make a 10-pin or a spare on the right-hand side, face our shoulders towards the 2-4-5 and throw a hard straight shot to avoid the chop. Watch this. I stand over on the left-hand left side of the lane, just as if I was going to make a 10-pin, and I roll it over the fifth arrow, straight at the spare. Here's the shot. No power, just a dead straight shot right at it. That's how to make the 2-4-5, the one exception to spare making in bowling. I've just shown you how to make spares over the third arrow when the head pin's been knocked down on the first ball. Now, if you re leave the head pin standing after your first shot, there's a very simple rule in the game of bowling to make all spares with the head pin standing. And the rule is this. You throw the ball right over your normal strike target that you were using for a strike. On this lane, it was the second arrow, as indicated by the red tape. And you just move five boards to the right on the approach from your original strike position on the approach. As you can see, I've left the one-two spare combination. Now, I want the ball to hit on the left side of the head pin in the one-two zone. So I'll make my move. Here's where I stood for my original strike shot, right there. Now, five boards to the right on the approach. One, two, three, four, five, as indicated by that little piece of tape and arrow. And all I have to do is throw the ball right back over my original strike target. Watch this. It's really easy. How much simpler can it be? Remember, when the head pin remains standing on the first ball, move five boards to the right on the approach and use your original strike target to convert that spare. You've learned all the fundamentals of bowling, and now we have to put them into practice. And a lot of people just don't know how to practice. They go out there and they just try to throw strikes and strikes and strikes and even miss spares. I've seen people throw the ball, they don't get a strike, just push the button, wipe off the spare. In this segment, we're going to show you how to practice, get the most for your money out of your practice, and how to improve your game. First place, remember we had the center of the approach, right down here is the basis for our strike target, the center board. This is where we line up with the second arrow. But all of us know that you cannot play every lane right down the second arrow. Some lanes are outside, some lanes are inside. The outside lane being somewhere around the first arrow, the inside trajectory someplace around the third arrow. You must practice all three of these types of shots in your practice session. 
So I recommend after you warm up eight to ten shots, just like a baseball pitcher, when they pull somebody out of the bullpen, they just don't grab him out of the dugout and say, here, go in and pitch. They let him warm up for a while, same way in bowling. Get the league a little early or your practice session, warm up eight or ten shots before you go full throttle. Then we'll practice the outside shot. From your basic starting position in the center, move approximately ten boards to the right and line up over the first arrow and throw a harder shot straight down. All right, we've practiced a few shots down the blue line into the first arrow, which is great practice. Now we'll go to the second arrow, as indicated by the white line, and this is the, basically the shot you see most often out there on any bowling center. 75% of the time, the pros play around the second arrow, and that'll fi you'll find that's the same for you. So stand in the center of the approach, line up your right shoulder over that second arrow, and just make a normal shot. And the third type of shot you should practice is the inside shot around the third arrow, as indicated by the red tape leading to the arrow. This shot works most often when you bowl in a late league and the bowling center has had a lot of play on it during the day, causing the lane to hook quite a bit. Move to the left side of the approach and throw your normal strike release, but allow it to go out over the third arrow and let the dry lane bring it into the pocket. Watch this shot. One of the greatest practice vehicles there is, is to shoot the 10 pin first and then go for the full rack. Now I mean that, shoot the 10 pin first, then shoot for the pocket. What this does is increases your accuracy and your discipline, and it still allows you to shoot for a strike ball on the second shot. Watch what I mean. All right, I've already knocked off the 10 pin, discipline and accuracy and I still have almost a full rack to practice for my strike shot. A two-fold purpose in one frame. Here we go, let's knock the rest of the pins down. You can make your own checklist for practice, but try the ones I've recommended. Eight to 10 warm-up shots before you really try to turn it on. Try the outside shot around the first arrow, the medium shot around the second arrow, and the inside shot around the third arrow. And also that great practice vehicle of knocking off the 10 pin for accuracy and discipline, and then shooting for the strike on the second ball. And finally, when you're in league play, watch your fellow competitors and watch your own teammates. Many times they'll show you the proper strike line, especially when one of them's red hot. Now that you've almost finished this video cassette tape, your game has already improved. And what that's going to do for you is get you in some pressure situations because now you're going to be a better bowler. You're going to get into situations where you may need a spare or a strike to win a game or a tournament. Now everybody who's a good bowler still messes up because sometimes they just don't have a game plan. These four principles I'm going to give you right now will give you a game plan to allow you to perform in the clutch under the pressure and if you can remember each one of these as you come up in that situation, you'll definitely have an advantage over the other player. Number one, remember to push the ball away at the same time you take your first step. I've seen even great bowlers, they get nervous. They're thinking, I need a strike to win the tournament, and they start walking before they ever push the ball away. They have no chance to pull it through in time. So number one of the principles, don't forget this, push the ball away at the exact same time you take that first step. Number two, Keep that arm close to your body all the way through that shot. Remember, you're nervous. Your knees are wobbly. You really need to get this shot. What many players want to do is they want to start steering that ball as soon as it gets by their body. Keep that arm close to your body. That'll keep your ball right next to your leg. That's the only guide you have to your target. This gives you accuracy and maximum leverage. Just like lifting a barbell, your ball is right next to your body for that maximum lift. Now the last two, and I think they're the most important things in a sport, especially in a clutch situation. Here it is, keep your eyes on the target. We've heard it in golf, we've heard it in a lot of sports. In bowling, that target, let's say it's a second arrow. You need the strike. 
I've seen even great pros. They're looking out there, and all of a sudden they're giving it this. They're looking at the moon. Or they throw the ball, and before they throw it, they look up. Here's the key. Keep your eyes on that second arrow target all the way through the shot, and let the ball go all the way down to the pins before you look to see what happens. I personally had a lot of trouble bowling on TV in the early 60s. And I, a guy gave me a, a little trick, and it's worked great for me, to keep my eyes all the way on the target until the ball hit the pins and let the crowd tell me what I got. And believe me, I went on a streak for seven years and I won, lost one championship match on television. A great practice vehicle. And finally, when you follow through, you've heard the statement, follow through with your hand towards the target. Well, that's kind of true, but not necessarily so. Here's a great practice vehicle which keep your arm close to your body and allow you to get the maximum leverage. Follow through with the inside of your elbow to the target. That way your hand can rotate in a natural position. Sure, you could have the hand towards the target, but the elbow is out here, you've got nothing. Or have the hand towards the target, the elbow in here. Allow the inside of the elbow to bisect those lines. Now let's go over it. Number one, under pressure. These four principles, all you have to think about. Push the ball out on the first step. Keep your arm close to your body. Keep your eyes on that target all the way through the shot until the ball hits the pins. Follow through towards that target and hold that follow through. And for you sports fans, here are some of the video programs guaranteed to have you cheering for your favorites. Once you step on that.